what's going on, Los Angeles? Welcome back to a very special edition of the Rams Skinny here on the LA Football Network. Got a very special guest from you for you, aside from our great co-host Skinny T here to my left. Down below, we have one of the best in the business. I think maybe the best in the business. Been doing it for quite some time now. Has been a founder before. Now he's the lead NFL draft analyst for Pro Football Focus and the co-host of the NFL Stock Exchange. Mr. Trevor Sicka, my man, thank you for the time. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, I appreciate the kind words in the intro. That means that means a lot. Uh, appreciate the thought that was into that, man. I, I've been doing this a long time, but doing stuff like this is um, a lot of fun for me. So I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Excited to talk a little Rams football with you. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we officially, as we were talking off air, like officially met at the Super Bowl, but now this is like your Super Bowl, the draft coming up in a month. Get to get into it. Uh, real quick, before we even jump in, are you in the Tampa area still? No. So I'm actually in Charlotte, North Carolina now. So okay. I've, uh, I, I've gone up north to uh, what Buccaneers fans call a division rival territory. So they make sure that I don't forget the fact that I'm no longer in the Tampa area. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're in NASCAR country now. And that is true. Uh, yeah. All that. Because I think Tampa is still the nicest airport I've ever been in. I love the Tampa airport. Thank you. It's beautiful. Tampa International Airport does not get enough credit for Dude. efficiency, speed, cleanliness, places to eat. Oh, thank you. You're you getting me fired up now. Just, yeah. uh, just as the first topic that we're talking about. My passion for the Tampa International Airport runs deep. So I appreciate you giving a shout out here at the start of the show. Dude, it's incredible. I was there like a year ago visiting my buddy who lives in Bradenton, just south of Tampa. And flew into Tampa and I was like, this is literally the nicest airport I've ever been in international. Maybe it compares like with I've been in Reykjavik, Iceland was like beautiful, too. But Ooh. that's, you know, a whole different conversation. But um, anyway, getting in the draft stuff, I want to ask you first, Trevor, off the bat, because the Rams, you know, ironically, first time since 2016 with the first round pick. And, you know, their their strategy is very different from the rest of the league, you know, no first round pick. We have, we have the mantra out here, F them picks, um, <laughs> which typically is just the early picks because, you know, nationally everyone is like, Oh, the Rams never have picks in reality. You know, they had 14 picks last year, 11 picks the year before they have a lot of picks, just never the early round ones. Right. I'm right. just curious your perception and analysis just kind of of the Ram strategy, just kind of your thoughts on their differing approach to the draft and what kind of the rest of the league does. Yeah, obviously I hated it. They're trying to put me out of business. Uh, you know, their their strategy, if everybody implemented it, then I wouldn't have a job. No, obviously I think that uh, I think what's most important about how you operate a draft strategy and a front office overall is that the head coach and the general manager just have to have to have a lot of continuity. And the longer that I've covered teams or this league as a whole, uh, the more I realize that's not always the case the way that it probably should be, right? Sometimes, you know, they're, uh, the general manager and the, the head coach are maybe on different timelines of their contract of when they were hired. And it's like, okay, well, the head coach wasn't really hired by the GM or the GM wasn't really there when the head coach was there. You know, sometimes you get the owners meddling in the picks and things like that. And it just can cause all sorts of chaos. And, and because of that, I think you always want to have more darts to throw at the dartboard, if you will. And the ones that are in the first round, well, they're the bigger needles. They'll be the closest to the bullseye uh, when you're throwing it. And so when you don't have those, it, 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 it's, it sort of makes it tough. But for Los Angeles, and the reason why I bring up that background, it, it, for Los Angeles specifically, very clearly, great continuity and chemistry between Sean McVay and Les Snead. Like, like these guys obviously work very well together. They are step for step in what they want to do with the team, how they see the team, where they are in a winning window, what's going to help them the most. And I think that matters even more than necessarily the first round picks as sacrilegious as it might be to say for a person who has my job title, but for the Rams, it's, it's wild that they have not had first round picks. Basically, what did you say since 2016? I mean, that's just an insane stat. But they have a Super Bowl, right? I mean, like they built a roster with some of the most talented players in the NFL, Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey, Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford. Like they've been able to bring in top tier talent. And I think what they have done is they have recognized when they have a legitimate shot to compete. And I think that right now they're sort of in this situation where, yeah, okay, there's not necessarily that player that we would want to trade a first round pick for. You know, there were rumors of, you know, Brian Burns going for two first round picks and things like that. But with that falling through and with Los Angeles kind of being where they're at right now, 
I think it makes sense for them to obviously say, okay, like let's keep the first round pick. Let's see what we can do in the first round here. Let's rebuild the team a little more. And especially with Jalen Ramsey no longer there, especially with Aaron Donald retiring. I just think that they have such a great uh, and realistic view of where they are. And even though it's been not always up, you know, progress is they say not, not linear, you know, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. They've had a pretty good idea of how open the window is for them to make a Super Bowl, what they've needed to do, because it's those teams that you see trade first round picks for players that you go, okay, sure, good player. Did it really matter for you? And I think that that's really where you get into some dangerous waters. But Los Angeles really has not been in that position. I, the Brian Burns thing, if they were the team that, that ended up doing something like that, two first round picks for an edge rusher. Okay. I'd probably push back on that one a little bit, but like the move to go get Stafford and, and what they did with Jalen Ramsey and all that kinds of stuff. I mean, you're investing in the right guys at the right time. So even though they haven't had first round picks and they've been a boring team to mock draft for, uh, I can't hate what they're doing because it's had results. Yeah, I've been covering them for uh, several years now, and it, and the draft season is a little bit different when uh, you don't have a, a first round pick. A little bit, right. bit a little bit boring, um, but they have a first round pick this time around. They're number for they're now. picking number nineteen for in now. the first round for now. For now, for now, for now. yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, you know, looking at what they've done through free agency, investing in the offensive line, uh, securing Demarcus Robinson, investing on the offense. And in the secondary, adding a couple pieces back there. Biggest name, Tredavious White, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Darius Williams is another piece back there. But glaring holes uh, left by Aaron Donald and Edge Rusher as well, kind of the, the top two spots that they need to add at. Is there a player in the first round at 19, Edge Rusher, defensive line, that can fall to them but is also going to be uh, a, a needle mover on the defense where they can get some pass rush um, that they weren't getting last season. 100%. Uh, and truly, you know, and, and I think that they got two young guys last year who I love that they were able to get the experience that they were Kobe Turner and, and Byron young. Um, those were guys that I, I again, I, I love to see what the Rams were able to get out of their young guys. You go to the offensive side of the ball as well. You don't even have to mention Puka Nakua, you know, you throw Steve Avila in there as well, who I think is going to be a really versatile piece for them. So just overall what they were able to do with the youth movement last year, I was very encouraged with and, Certainly, I think that it feels like it is most likely that they are going to go back to the defensive line. As you mentioned there, I look at a guy like Laatu Latu from UCLA, which we have a joke on my podcast, the NFL Stock Exchange. You know, Latu coming from UCLA, Los Angeles Rams, low moving cost, right? You know, to get the guy to move his stuff from his one from his dorm or his apartment into another apartment, you know, somewhere else in LA, a little closer to the facility, low moving costs if you draft the guy. So you're saving the franchise a little bit of money. But look, I mean, he's been the best pass rusher in college football over the last two years, over 23% pass rush win percentage. Sure, he's not quite the athlete that a Jared Verse or a Dallas Turner are, which I mean, perhaps those guys make it to 19. I think it's much mess, less likely for them. But it's just the overall production. I mean, you cannot deny from what Latu has been able to do over the last two years. So he's somebody who, if he's on the board at 19, I have often mocked him to the Rams there at that spot. Uh, interior defensive line, you know, it's kind of all over the place, right? Because I love Johnny Newton from Illinois. I think that he's a top 10 player in this class. I think he should be picked somewhere in the top 12. I think he's that good. Doesn't feel like the NFL is as hot on him as I am. And so I wonder, okay, what does he get to 19? Is he the, you never want to say Aaron Donald replacement, but is he the guy who's going to be the next man up on the interior at that three technique spot? Because I think he's done a great job over the last two years at Illinois showcasing that he is a future pro. I think the same can be said with Byron Murphy, the second from Texas, who this past year played very, very well, both in run defense and pass rushing, really good athlete, um, good strength on him as well. Shoot. Some of the best praise that I could have for Byron Murphy the second is Texas in an odd front had 380 pound Tavondre Sweat <laughs> playing as the defensive end in a three four setup, and they had Byron Murphy playing at the nose because they had faith that this guy could hold up in the middle against centers, against guards, against double teams, and all that kinds of stuff. So that's some of the best praise that I could get, that you're kicking a 380-pound guy out the defensive end because you know you have that luxury to be able to do so. But those are the three guys when I think about uh, most common mock draft selections for the Rams at 19. It comes down to uh, Johnny Newton from Illinois, Byron Murphy the second from Texas, those two interior defensive linemen, uh, and then Laatu Latu is the edge rusher from UCLA.
yeah, we've uh, love all those guys talked about him a lot. Lot two is kind of like our, I think our like dream. You know, anytime we can keep an LA guy in LA, like that's you know great for us, and we love that for coverage and and obviously that the type of player he is too. Um, I love you mentioned Newton because I agree. I feel like he's not getting the same kind of love around other circles that maybe deserved and would be a great fit. Um, so my next question for you though, and this you know. Kind of probably put you on the spot a little bit. I know the Rams aren't your like main team of coverage, so uh, apologize if it puts you on the spot. But we always joke, Les Snead is the guy that if there's a glaring hole, he's going to do the opposite. So the need right now is edge and tackle. Like the, all three guys you listed would be home run picks, but knowing Les Snead is going to pick like offensive tackle or a receiver randomly in the first. So thinking that way, who are maybe some names that if the Rams stay put at 19 and they don't go on the defensive front, they're like, okay, you know what? I could see these guys at least filling some fun spots for the Rams next year. Man, this is, I mean, that's a great question. And I love the question because it forced you to go a little outside the box, right? I mean, like we think, oh, this team has a major need. They have to draft this in the first round. But if we're being honest, you know, when we have draft conversations long enough, we get to the fact that, okay, well, the point of the draft is to just pick the best player available, right? I mean, it's, it's, you want your franchise and your roster to be in a good place to where you have that kind of flexibility. So to me, it's, it, it's a great exercise. And I don't think that one that we do enough, um, yeah, offensive tackle, I, I guess, you know, you could, you could take a swing at the offensive tackles at 19. If somebody's there that you absolutely love, you know, JC Latham from Alabama, Talise Fuanga from Oregon state, like if one of those guys are there. I guess that kind of could make sense. You know, I think the somewhat easy answer would be like Brock Bowers is the ultimate wild card, right? I mean, like if you just think that he is this total chess piece type of an offensive player, let's say Brock Bowers doesn't get picked in the top 10. He's fallen a little bit farther down mocks. You know, uh, let's look at a scenario where, okay, because Los Angeles has a second round pick, but then they have, two third round picks because they've got that one comp pick and then they've got a lot of picks outside of that like you guys are talking about look at the denver broncos right let's say denver's sitting there at number 12 and they miss out on a quarterback right let's say the top four are gone they don't love michael Penix. they don't love bo nicks they're not going to take one to 12 well denver then all of a sudden is like okay we need to trade back we need to get more picks Maybe you can bump up from 19 to 12 if you're the Rams and Brock Bowers is still on the board. You're given 19 and maybe, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what it would take. Maybe some of those, a couple of day three picks, maybe it's that 99 pick uh, at the back end of the third round. You jump up seven spots and the ultimate wild card is you go get a guy like Brock Bowers. So I think that that is where my mind goes to of uh, if the Rams weren't going to hone in on defensive line, what could they possibly go for? That's where my mind goes. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. I think uh, Brock Bowers on this offense would be electric. Uh, that kind of gets me excited there. Um, so, you know, jumping to the you know second, third round mm -hmm. idea, going back to the defensive side, you know, they're at 54 um, and then 99 as well. Um, another third round pick that's uh, escaping my uh, 83. I got eight. it up right here. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you for that. Um, you know, defensive linemen in, the, in in those regions that we should be looking out for. Yeah, so I mean, day two is always kind of a wild card, right? Because I, I think I think everybody can recognize talent for the most part in the first round, right? A lot of these teams have it, every board is different, right? Because some guys, okay, you look at a corner, okay, is he more of a man coverage guy? Is he an off cover a coverage type of a player? You know, when you look at pass rushers, is this guy a hand in the dirt four three defensive end? Is he is he an outside linebacker? So teams' boards differ, but generally, I think the talent at the top is pretty close to consensus second round is where you really start to get these teams infusing their personal scouting flavor into what their big boards are going to be like and so this one always just kind of depends what kind of a guy that you want to go for so again there's a lot of different shapes and sizes players where i'll start at like 52 you know if they're in a situation at number 52 if they would love a um Quick penetrating three technique defensive tackle, yeah, Braden Fisk from Florida State can make it to them at number 52. I think that that would make sense. If they don't get a defensive tackle there, if you're waiting a little bit towards pick, what was it, uh, 83 and 99, then you're looking at, okay, maybe a Brandon Doralis from Oregon. You know, he's sort of an interior guy, but he's also, he could be a defensive end. I think maybe the same for Ruka Rororo from Clemson. Maybe they would 
covet that sort of versatility in there. If they want to get more towards the power part of the interior trenches, maybe a Chris Jenkins Jr. from Michigan, you probably have to take him at 52. He probably is not going to be there by the time that you get to, to 83. So you would have to take him at that spot. Edge rusher, I think, has a lot more creativity, right? Where is Marshawn Nealon going to go? The the the, uh, the edge rusher from Western Michigan, bigger body, 270 pounds. I guess same story for Braylon Trice, right? So many pressures for Braylon Trice at Washington over the last couple of years. He's not a sack master. His finesse game sometimes leaves some to be desired, but man, he will line up in a wide nine alignment. He will go straight through your chest of the quarterback, and I think he had a lot of pressures because of it. But then you got guys you can take a chance on a little bit later. Austin Booker. I think from Kansas, somebody that's very moldable, hasn't played a ton of football as a starter, but very moldable. You like the athleticism, you like the build. Uh, I like Gabriel Murphy, UCLA guy, gets to stay at home. I think that that would be a good spot for him. Xavier Thomas, the edge rusher from Clemson. So I, there's just there's a ton of different players for them. There's a lot of names to know, but it really just kind of depends on what they prioritize. Are they going to streamline a certain type of pass rusher? Are they going to open it up to more versatility? Because that will sort of be able to hone down those all those names that I mentioned and some more that I, I didn't even mention there. But when I think of LA and some players that they could use, those are the first couple of names that come to my mind. Love it. Skinny T's been been uh up in the stock of Austin Booker out of Kansas. So love Trying to go. him up. There you Trying. go. I'm a new convert to uh Xavier Thomas as well. I'm Dude Xavier man, he is he's got good tape, man. And yeah. I think the puzzling part is <sighs> I think he was the number three overall recruit in the 2018 recruiting class. And here he is, it's, you know, it's 2024 and he's not in the league yet. You know, I think he was, I think he wanted to leave after 2021, but felt like he could get more backfield production. It's a foot injury derails 2022. So he wasn't going to leave then. And I, I got to watch Xavier Thomas at the shrine bowl in person. And there were a couple of players at the shrine bowl that you just went, okay, you're, better than everybody else here. Like you're a future pro. And I felt like Xavier Thomas was one of those players. Yeah. hundred percent. So I think he looked great in horns. Um, all right, let me ask you this. Call it buzz, call it rumors, whatever you want, but there is some chatter about the Rams surprising even more. And then we talked last question going quarterback, maybe at 19 or for sure. I think we've talked a lot. I think at one point with one of the 11 picks you know they just signed jimmy g to a one-year deal they have stetson bennett from last year but really don't know what his you know kind of outside the field is really looking like moving forward he is supposed to rejoin the team here this offseason but there's a lot of question marks there so you know there's been chatter like do they go a bo nix or michael Penix at 19 um not saying we would love that but that's been talked about your thoughts on on kind of the rams and and the qb position this is my favorite bo nix landing spot and I, I like Bo Nix a lot, man. I mean, going into this season, uh, when we went through our summer scouting exercises, Bo Nix was QB3 for me, and he was close to Drake May. Now, obviously, Jaden Daniels having the year that he had and McCarthy really improving the way that he has has bumped those guys up, but I don't think any less of Bo Nix. Like, I, I genuinely believe that Bo Nix could be a good NFL starter one day, and you know, you'll see what happens from there. I think that sometimes people just say, like, oh, this guy will be uh, he'll be multiple all pro. He'll lead you to Super Bowls. And it's like, OK, there's a lot that has to happen from them being college players, even very talented college players to getting to that side. So I often just like to say, hey, I could see this guy as a full time starter. And then you see how they evolve there once they get into that role in the NFL. And I believe that for Bo Nix. I'd love for him to sit behind Matthew Stafford. I would love for him to get to work with Sean McVay in that offense. Again, I, I don't think that it happens at 19, but you know, again, if you're in a situation where you got a lot of ammo behind you, if you're sitting there at 52 and I don't know, sometime in the thirties, I'm just picking a random number, 37, 38, something like that. You have the chance to trade up and maybe go get him. I think that that to me uh, would make sense for them because yeah, I, the Jimmy G signing doesn't really move the needle for me. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely take Bo Nix over Stetson Bennett in a heartbeat when it comes <laughs> to being the backup of this team and being the developmental quarterback. We don't know how much longer Matthew Stafford's going to do this. And so getting Nix in this year, I would love it. I can't seem to make it happen because I don't think the Bo Nix lasts until pick 52. So I don't really want to pick him at 19 for the Rams. But regardless of kind of how we get there, 
that is my favorite landing spot for Knicks. It, it is him being in in Los Angeles. And uh, by the way, the phrase, yeah, he'd look good in horns. I've never heard that before. And that is an elite <laughs> saying for uh, talking about a player going to a certain team. So I absolutely love that. There we go. Love that. Good stuff. Need, need to get on some Rams Twitter more often. <laughs> I do. I do. I feel like I, I've got a, I've got a handful of, 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 of Los Angeles Rams people that I'll go back and forth with every now and then, but I feel like you need to expand the, uh, the, uh, the database, the friendship, if you will. Well, there so, you go. You got us now. So. I, I've been high on uh, uh, Spencer Rattler, uh, just an arm strength guy. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think eight, him at 83 at 54, is that too much of a reach? Is that too, too crazy? So I don't know if you'll get him at 83. You know, like I really don't like he's another guy who I th- I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of teams that would love to pick Spencer Rattler in the third round. And you guys know how it goes. If there's a lot mm-hmm. of teams that want a quarterback at a certain spot, guess what? They're going earlier because somebody is going to up the price and up the desire and they're going to go get him a little bit earlier. So I wonder if I wonder if Rattler ends up sneaking into like back end part of the second round at that point. So I I, I think that he also would be a great fit. Man, Spencer, it's it, it just like anything in life. Truly, it, it's it's hard to overcome first impressions. You know, like you, that is what mm-hmm. people remember about you the most. And for as much as I feel like people, now I'm getting philosophical, but like you know, people don't necessarily want to go the extra mile to learn the details or follow up or things like that. Sometimes they'll see something or a player or whatever, and they'll just see a glimpse of them the first time, whatever it is, and they're like, "Nope, that's who that player is to me always." The Oklahoma version of Spencer Rattler is not the same version of Spencer Rattler that is coming in the NFL right now. Mm -hmm. He was a gunslinger, risky, sort of like a hothead quarterback when he was in the Lincoln Riley system at Oklahoma. He goes to South Carolina and what he has become, the quarterback that he has become in that program under Shane Beamer and that offense and just the, the personal growth that he has had you could see it on the field, man. That maturity level it is so much higher, and and I can I can tell that it's from a personal side of things because I see it so easily bleed over into all the facets of his game. Guys, his pocket presence is so fantastic this past season compared to what it was at Oklahoma when it really did not exist at all, and he was pressured on almost forty percent of his dropbacks. Like if there was any quarterback in the country that had a reason to throw mm-hmm. their offensive line under the bus or blame the offense for him not being able to have the stats that he had. It was probably Spencer in South Carolina. And yet he was continually, I mean, he's, there's, there's plenty of clips of him, you know, going to the sideline, pumping up his offensive line, you know, like he was just trying to be a leader as best that he could. And, and I think the NFL has really taken note of that because it feels like throughout this whole process, Jim Nagy was the first to kind of like talk about this as we were getting closer to the senior bowl. He was like, look, the NFL is a lot higher on Spencer Rattler than it seems like the media and the fans are. I'm just telling you guys that is a little bit of a relay here. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes that could be, you know, Jim pumping up his guys to the senior bowl. But I really do think that there was a lot of uh, truth to that. And I think third round to me is the floor for, for Rattler. But I'm starting to think that maybe back end of the second round is, is possible for him too. Wow. Well, we found our clip that we're going to cut up because uh, that uh, I think the Rams fans will be excited about uh, the potential of him. Um, I, 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 I know I said 20 minutes, but I'll make this quick. I got two quick ones for you, Trevor. Ryan, Go ahead. No, no, no. Else? It's all good. <laughs> um, so first, uh, I know this is a, a Rams podcast, but just quickly, you know, when looking at the other LA guys, USC and UCLA, and obviously we talked about one with law two and who could potentially be Rams. But when you look at Brendan Rice and Tosh Washington, who I love Tosh Washington, I think he's going to be a great NFL player. Maybe he's not getting as much hype. Marshawn Lloyd. Yeah. You look at the Murphy twins, as you mentioned, just, Talk a little bit about maybe some of these other USC and UCLA products that are going to be mid-round guys, but have a lot of potential and upside for the league. Yeah, I like Gabriel Murphy. I, I really do. I know that him and his, his his twin brother Grayson, they're very similar, obviously twins. So they're mm-hmm. they're they're built the same, they got the same measurables. Uh it was funny. Again, I saw those guys at the Shrine Bowl and mm-hmm. they their beards were exactly the same. Like their hair was grown out exactly the same. It's like y'all schedule your beard trimmings and your haircuts too. I mean, like, and it really, they, they just do like everything together. And, and, you know, I, I like Gabriel's game a little bit more than Grayson's. Grayson's a little bit more of a, you know, I'm going to kind of run through you type of a player. He uses more strength. He focuses on more of a bull rush and a power profile to his pass rushing. Gabriel's got a little bit quicker of hands. He focuses on the two handed swipe, 
uh, staying off of offensive tackles, really disengaging those blocks. And I think that's a little bit more translatable to the next level. So I think that Gabriel's probably, I like him in the third round. I really do. I think Grayson's probably like early day three, fourth, fifth round, something like that. Um, Brendan Rice is somebody who, you know, his his tape, I'm not going to lie, is it, it, it's a little confusing to me just because mm-hmm. he's so fundamentally sound, but there are times when, okay, like I'll watch you separate really well and then I go to the senior bowl and he doesn't separate really well, but he was also like a contest to catch monster at the senior bowl. So now it's like, okay, I have these kind of two different versions of you. The ones I saw at USC versus the one that I saw um, at the shrine or at the senior bowl. But I think he's a good receiver, a well-rounded receiver. Washington, somebody that I got to watch again uh, in, in, uh, in person at the shrine bowl, him and Malik Washington from Virginia were two of just the most uncoverable receivers that were at that event every single day of practice. Those guys were putting on a highlight film. I was, uh, had a clip to tweet of them every single day because they were either winning a one-on-one or gaining separation in the red zone or something like that. So uh, I like all those guys, Marshawn Lloyd, Big time playmaker, man. And this is somebody who was a four star recruit, borderline a five star recruit. I can't remember if one of the um, uh, outlets ended up having him a five star recruit. But when he went to South Carolina, they love this dude and ends up tearing his ACL early. And so, you know, the second year, it's all about just rehabbing. Third year, okay, like it's his first time year as a starter, but things have obviously kind of changed for him. Goes over to USC and I think USC was giving him a little bit more freedom to do what he wanted to do. Now you could make the case of whether or not that was the best long-term move for him because there are times when Marshawn Lloyd, who is a phenomenal athlete, will just try to do the Reggie Bush switch fields kind of a thing. And it's like, okay, that's not going to work in the pros, but it felt like he did have a lot more freedom and open spaces playing in the Pac-12 and playing with USC. So you were able to see kind of that getaway speed a little bit more from him this past year. So I think that that's what he boasts very, very highly. The last guy and and just a guy that, man, I, I want to like so bad is Kalen Bullock from USC, right? I mean, because this is a down safety class. You're kind of searching for who's really going to stand out in this group. And I like Tyler Newbin from Minnesota the best. He's my top safety in this class. But outside of and, and Jaden Hicks, I think from Washington State is also fantastic. I think he'll pro, he'll be either safety two or safety three for me. But Bullock's the ultimate wild card because the best of Kalen Bullock is all pro at the NFL level. Defense mm-hmm. changing, right? Single high ability, center field ability. You can play cover one. You can play cover three. Like he's just the guy who has the range, has the ball skills, have everything. But he just doesn't have the physical profile. He's mm-hmm. lighter, lighter in the weight, doesn't love tackling, doesn't love, I mean, he, doesn't, he just doesn't have the density to come up and really hit. And when you are a safety, taking that word, literally, mm-hmm. you are the safety valve. You are the last line of defense. You have to be able to tackle. And if I can't rely on you for tackling, yes, the interceptions and the forced incompletions and the range, I mean, it's fantastic. It's got value, but man, when we need you to come up and make a play and make a tackle, sometimes he is just lacking in that area. So he is just the roller coaster that uh, I keep getting on the ride, man. I, I can't quit it. I keep getting on the ride. I keep getting back in line. But um, he's somebody who, at his best, uh, is somebody you could build the back end of a defense around. But at his worst, he's somebody that's uh, going to be tough to be reliable. So I'm fascinated to see uh, how his NFL career just plays out. Yeah, I'm, I'm the exact same way with Bullock. You know, I've been at every SC game for the last three years covering them and um, you know, I liken him in terms of like, in terms of size and, and a little bit of his ability to like Justin Simmons when he was coming out of Boston college, um, as like a third round pick. And, and what's hard with Bullock, as you said, is that, that kind of inconsistency. And it's like, how much of that is just the horrendous defensive coaching that was at USC and how much yeah. of that is just the player profile and consistency. So if he can like break the mold of what was happening on the back end on the, on the coaching staff, I think he has really high upside. So, um, it's a good segue to my last question. So this time of year, I love it. The, t- the hashtag on Twitter is my guy. Everyone has kind of their guy. Who is your guy in this draft class? I got a lot. I mean, this is, this is, you know, like picking between my kids. Uh, as you can tell, like how passionately I talked about Bo Nix, I think that Bo Nix at this point is one of my guys, but I would say that the, the, uh, among, among the many, it feels like the guy that I'm just going to cater for the most is Mike Sanders still from Michigan. And I, I, I know I'm not like totally alone. It's, it's, impossible to watch his tape and not love him but like 
I got him as a top 40 player, man. I mean, he might end up being like a top 30 player for me. The draft is all about just getting good football players in there. And this is a former receiver who turned into a defensive back and he's got the ball skills. He's got the short area quickness. He'll come up and hit you with everything that he's got. He'll play strong safety. He'll play in the box. He'll play as a nickel coverage defender against all sorts of different assignments. It's just so hard for me to watch him and not absolutely love what I see. I felt similarly. Now I don't have them graded as high because they're different players, but I felt similarly with Devon Witherspoon last year. You know, there was a lot of debate. Hey, who's CB1? Is it Devon Witherspoon or is it Christian Gonzalez? And it felt like there was a, you know, I, I use the word war lightly, a battle, whatever, on Twitter between who was CB1 for these two different camps and these two different supporting uh, units. I love Christian Gonzalez. He was also a, I think, a top 10 player for me. But Devon Witherspoon was like five overall for me. I just, I love the mentality, the ferociousness, the fiery competitor that he was. And San Rastill from Michigan is that. He's not quite the coverage player and the athlete that Witherspoon is, but he is that same competitor. Give me those guys every time. I'm such a sucker for a good defensive back who's got that kind of mentality. So I would say of all the guys in the draft, I've got a lot of guys that I love, but San Rastill is somebody who I will pound the table for if I were any team. Love it. Well, and obviously you nailed it with Weatherspoon and Rams fans get to see him twice a year. And uh, that's never fun with how good he is. So, uh, well, Trevor Sikama, thank you so much for the time. Lead draft analyst for PFF, co-host of the NFL Stocks Exchange podcast with Connor Rogers. Uh, we certainly pre- appreciate your expertise, your time, your analysis, and uh, bringing that, uh, that, that luscious locks and great beard on the show with us. So thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it, man. I appreciate it, guys. Anytime, truly. <laughs> we